right, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Westlake Audio for making this little get together possible. It's uh, it's always fun to work with those guys, and uh, yeah, I'm glad you're all here, so to say. So um, I have been working uh, on Mellotron since the late '80s, since I was in high school, and it uh, it always fascinated me how this rather weird technology actually worked back in those days. So the, the I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the, originally the Mellotron had uh, tapes, one tape for each key. So when you press the, uh, uh, a key, uh, the tape playback would start and the sound would be on the tape would be played back. So f for instance, uh, on, a, on, a, on the, the smaller Mellotrons there were 35 tapes that had three, three sounds each on each tape. So there were flute, cello, and strings, for instance, on, on recorded on each, each tape. And uh, it was a very peculiar format, uh, three eighths inch tape with three tracks. And this if, uh, it might seem odd, but if you think about it, that corresponds approximately to the width of a piano key. And they were using piano keys inside of the instrument uh, for, for the basis of the mechanism, basically. So the and and so the benefit of that is that that you get uh, when you put the tapes next to each other, you won't get in have a you don't have to have a keyboard that fans out if you would have to have a wider tape or or it quarter inch tape would be a bit too flimsy for so so to say. So the back in those days, the this was the only way to get uh, uh, sample playback. In in I will get to later what the alternatives were, but, but the, the, there was basically only the Mellotron that that gave you sample playback of of instruments, so to say, and that's why they 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 got uh, really popular to uh, in in the late 60s by with all kinds of musicians like. The Beatles and the Rolling Stones and uh, Moody Blues and David Bowie used it, and it's it's all over prog rock, of course, that you might be familiar with, like Genesis and Yes and all those bands used it. But uh, the interesting thing is that it actually started here in California in in Upland with uh, Harry Chamberlain, who actually invented the, the, this principle. He um, in the in the early 50s, he, he got his first uh, reel-to-reel uh, Ampex tape machine, and fairly soon after, he it just hit him that he could he, he, he could facilitate the playback of music by because he was a hobby musician himself by recording sounds on tape and then playing it back with the keyboard. So he's the originator, and the 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 first Chamberlain 200 came out in in around about 1950, 50, 51. Uh, and that was a 35 key. In this case, there were no wider tapes, so it was quarter inch tape. And then the sounds were stacked after each other. So there was a spooling mechanism, so you could, um, it, it turned out, in fact, that it was more, more likely that you would have to hand, cr hand crank it, because the motor mechanism didn't quite work as he was thinking it should. So it w but the original idea was to have uh, eight buttons, and you press the button and it would scroll to the, to the new sound. And uh, like, since there were mo mono full-track full tapes, it was only one, one sound per, per tape, so to say, at the time. So you'd have like flute, and then you pr have to press the button, and then it would scroll. But of course, for each sound, you had all 35 keys, of course. So, to say. so and that that was the origin of the rather strange G to F keyboard that got standard standard also on the Mellotron, so to say. So, um, and he uh, he he had this rather brilliant first uh, concept of an instrument. It wasn't. Perfect in the in the mechanism or anything. The the springs were were like like fishing rods, if you can imagine, and not spiral springs. So the whole thing was not 100% working. But the, but the the main mainframe of the instrument and everything was very well done. But then he had this idea that that he would make it this accessible to everybody, to like like the radio or the TV that had were just around then had become a big big hit. So he uh, looked at the Hammond and said, "I want to, uh, I want to make uh, uh, like a home organ version of this." So on the left-hand side, he he put in rhythm loops, 
So there were rhythms and accompaniments on the left-hand keyboard, and on the right-hand keyboard there were the solo sounds, like flutes and bassoon and, and strings and whatnot. So he, he spent a lot of time and, and there was a lot of trouble to record these, um, the rhythms because they were, there was, it was extremely problematic, of course, because he, there were no multi-track tapes and, of course, no digital editing or anything like that. So he, he, he basically had, they, they only had a metronome and played according to the metronome and then, you know, in several sessions to try to get that synced up, especially since he had on the left-hand side of the left keyboard were the rhythms, but then he had accompaniments on the right-hand side of the left keyboard, which were supposed to be like little flute melodies. That so you'd start the two samples at the same time. They would accomp the accompaniment would complement the, the rhythm, <laughs> but uh, and you can imagine recording this kind of stuff and trying to get it in sync without having a multi-track click track or anything like that. It's just a nightmare. So, uh, but but uh, he 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 got it sort of right, but uh, it's, and it it got fairly popular because it's uh, any type of back then any type of electronic accompaniment or anything like that it was was of course like like a word it's a sideman or something it was completely electronic so it didn't sound like a real band but this was a real band a real recording so these double manual uh, Chamberlain 500 music masters as he called them got to be quite popular and they, they put up a little factory in, in Upland and had about 10 people employed and were, were, were it was like a little little cottage industry so to say so, so he, he, he developed this further he put out the 600 music master which uh, on the left hand side were, was an even bigger keyboard but then he realized this, this business with accompaniment was just too, too troublesome so he put just rhythms on 17 <coughs> keys and then 25 lead keys and then tr the 35 lead keys to the right were the same so to say so it, it was a quite a complicated machine because there was uh, uh, these machines had three track tapes and a scrolling mechanism. So each each uh, unit, so to say, had three times six sounds, eighteen sounds. And you would the the selection of the three sounds was of course easy. You just there was a rack of head uh, headlock underneath the tapes, and you just mechanically moved the headlock sideways to the three different tracks. So it was a very straightforward mechanism. You can uh, even mix between adjacent tracks when you put, put the head just between the, the, the two A and B or B and C, so to say. But uh, the mechanism to spool the whole thing was a bit more intricate. So, uh, But the principle was, was like a reel-to-reel, like -reel, but it was just 35 of them next to each other. So you'd press a button and, and, and the tapes were, were uh, rolled up on rolls in the front and the back and the and when you press the button there was a motor that and there was a chain connecting these two um, <coughs> rolls basically so when you press the button the the whole mechanism would stop scrolling and then there was a little a little extra tape that hopefully kept kept track of where you were and it would stop it hopefully in the right point but if it, it was no real electronics inside here it was just relays he was not a big guy in electronics and didn't want to consult other companies so he made, so it was all like relays and 120 volt motors and everything like that so if it missed that little uh, <laughs> split in the tape to tell it where to stop the whole thing would just the rip tapes would just rip out so it was uh, he, 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 he was really trying to jump a little bit too far compared to what the technology actually was yes so it wasn't a loop it was a it was actually a little reel to reel. Uh, no, it, it, it's it's a, it, it's it's um, it's not an endless loop. Definitely not an endless. Oh, loop. that's what I was wondering. Exactly. It, it's 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 a double loop like this, but it has an end and a start. So, oh, so. so when you press press the tape, there's a little spring <coughs> mechanism that uh, that 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 when you press the tape, the the, the the tape gets fed into a little box, and when then when you when you release the key, there's a spring that pulls it back. Otherwise, you couldn't get piano and and even on a flute, that's the main thing with with these instruments that you get the actually the attack, so to say. Yes. Uh, was there a harmonic relationship between the keys and the names that we normally associate 
with the piano keys and the music that would come out? Uh, could you harmonize different keys? Yeah, th there was a relationship, but it was not very logical. And I got that explanation when I saw the uh, a prototype that he had built. The first prototype for this uh, Music Master didn't have a key keyboard keyboard, so to say, on the left-hand side. There were co different colored uh, buttons that that were. Uh, it, it was a piano keyboard, but it didn't have the white and black keys like sharps and, and full keys. It, it just had blue and red buttons. So there was some sort of system that he, had, he had thought out with that. But my guess is that he then, when he, they were going into production, he just had the right hand keyboard and just said, oh, I'm, I'm going to order these special blue and red and all that. I'm just going to take this keyboard and put it on the left hand side. And my main reason why I have this, I think this is correct, is that the, 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 the first key, the leftmost key on the left hand side on a 500 is actually blocked. It's not used. So I, the, the, and the master only th contains 34 um, uh, keys, basically. So there's 17 ry rhythms and 17 uh, uh, accompaniments. And, the one, and because there's a 35 keyboard, he just took the same instead of having to order custom stuff. He just he just took the same on the on the other side, and that's why the, the and the masters were already made and everything. So I have them. I can I, I can see clearly that he marked. They were first marked 400. That was the supposed the, the name of the of the music master. But then he changed it to 500, and it it, it got the actual black and white piano key, but uh, keyboard on both sides. But it's not logical. It doesn't make much sense as far as the C and F and, uh, and all, all that. As far as the, that's what, what many people ask. But there was like a manual, so it just told you uh, how, to, how it would work. Now, the, the, how the Melodion company comes into this is that the, one of his sales guys, uh, called Bill Franson, he um, was dissatisfied with, this, with the production speed of, of the Chamberlain Company. So he just on his own decided to take two of the Music Master 500s to England and just uh, present it as his invention, the Franson, which is uh, uh, kind of a, a, a shady thing to do, of course, but he did that. And he got in touch with some uh, the Bradley brothers in, in England who were running in Birmingham a little factory making cheap uh, tape heads and, and other mechanical stuff. So uh, he, uh, after a while, th they found out that he wasn't the technical genius he claimed to be. So, but then they had already got financing from, from a guy called Eric Robinson, who was a big band leader and a TV personality back in those days, who had like a big band jazz show in the 60s in England, and uh, David Nixon, uh, a, 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 a magician, actually. So he, they conjured up the money for, for this yeah. project. And, and the, the, maybe some of you have seen, there's, a, there's like a clip of two elderly gentlemen, one is sitting Ne next to uh, a Mellotron, the first version of it, which is also a double manual home organ style instrument. And those, this, this is, David Nixon is playing it, and Eric Robinson is presenting the whole thing. So, th so the, they, but the Mellotron company just took the idea right off ident identical uh, principle with the two keyboards and the, 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 the six banks on each side with the spooling mechanism and the three track tapes. Exactly the same as the Music Master. Yes. Were, were they the same sounds exactly? <laughs> uh, they they were <laughs> they did their own recordings, uh, the Melton Company through Eric Robinson who had the orchestra. Uh, so they're all all except, ironically enough, the strings, <laughs> which is the most popular Melton sound. That is actually a Chamberlain sound. That they. I, uh, nobody knows the details anymore, but somehow they, they decided on the, they, on the first Mellotron, it didn't have any strings. The, the, uh, so then when they redid the masters, they introduced the strings, and my guess is just that they, they didn't, couldn't get the, 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 the string sound so good as they heard it in the, in the Chamberlain Music Master. So they just took, took those tapes and made that to a master. And it, it sounds uh, slightly different. The, the, the Chamberlain version of it is more hi-fi, so to say. So then the, uh, they, they, they did, did exactly the same instrument and were, had the same concept of sets. There's photos from Harrods in London, this very famous uh, department store, where they're demonstrating it. They were, and also this, the whole setting of this promo video is in like the 
upper middle class uh, home where you're supposed to be entertaining your friends and family, so to say, or maybe ballrooms to sort of replace the orchestra and, and, and so forth. Wow. But that that failed dismally. Like like even though the the, the Melodron had a better, it had real electronics inside to control the the station selection and everything. It was a bunch better working instrument, but still way too complicated for a client like that. Uh, Peter Sellers had one, and Princess Margaret also had one for a time. But, you know, you, you just move it a little bit, and then the pinch rollers are out of adjustment, and it's just, it's nothing close to a Hammond, so to say, which you can, <coughs> which is which is m also a complicated mechanism, but way more better thought out and, and more more adapted for, for touring or use. So in any case, so th that failed, but then, ironically, the, the uh, Moody Blues and the Beatles started uh, using it on records, and then it uh, it just uh, blew blew up, so to say. So, um, Daniel, if you can come up and play a little something that people might know. So, and um, but the Moody Blues were probably the ones that were were. Uh, most th that's their music was probably the one that was the big breakthrough for the mellotron. Yeah, just. Uh, almost. <laughs> I, yes. <that's laughs> so yeah. So just a little short. We didn't have much to, time to prepare this. And but uh, the so the mellotron company just. Uh, uh, Continued with the sales of these white instruments uh, of the 400 and and had quite a, uh, quite some success with it. But they made one big blunder, and that's the motor control in those to control the the capstan motor that it's constant in speed. It it was just didn't work well. So so they the, the, it didn't stay in tune over time. And when you pressed many keys, it would go out of tune. So that that was uh, the main reason that the company failed uh, because people were it was troublesome enough with the pinch rollers and the heavy instrument of tapes and whatnot, but then that it also just wouldn't stay in tune was a big big failure. They came out with a with a with an improved version of the car, but uh, then they had already sold around about a thousand pieces that were out, out already out on the market. So that's what mainly gave the Mellotron the bad bad reputation, so to say. Uh, so, so for example, Kraftwerk used uh, uh, used this sound on on the 400 on on Trans Europe Express, if you might. And then they even used exactly. Then they used, I think, on the on the. If you take the last chord again, they used this as the, the the speed of the motor to to simulate like a train passing. So, so that's uh, 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 that's another thing that also Moody Blues used. They 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 used the pitch control create creative creative creatively to to just have an effect which you couldn't do in a string orchestra, of course not. And and you you can hear it uh, on Timothy uh, Timothy Leary that song on uh, on one of the Moody Blues records, so it's it it it, it definitely has had opened up for for the um, uh, for the musicians to start using samples basically, so so it, it, so it, and if you it, it's it's kind of ironic that it went so in such a roundabout manner to find its way from the intention was really. Uh, uh, to have it in, in as a home entertainment organ, and and it, it turned out to be something that pro musicians would use and create new and interesting music in the in the 60s. Now the the uh, the Mellotron company got lucky because of the British pop music explosion and the general you know explosion in in, in rock and pop music that was started in 67 and continued all through the 70s. But still, they they never. Uh, improved on their on their on the instrument and made that big blunder with the motor car that I told you about. So they got into big trouble when 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 the the first string machines like the Selena string ensemble came out, and they went uh, went bankrupt around about 1980, so to say. 
So by then, the, the name had trans been transferred to the United States, and there were uh, several bankruptcies in the United States with 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 the company that owned the tapes, etc. So when uh, in 1989, when all this came up for for auction, uh, my business partner then, David Keane, he bought all of these assets, and it was really interesting that nobody was interested in the old parts and tape library that exist that was in, in America at that time. Uh, it, it, no, it, there was that company had tried to do a digital version of the Mellotron, so everybody just were, was interested in those in the Macintosh computers. So he, for a, for a relatively modest amount, he was able to to buy a big chunk of the original tape library. So he started to make new tapes, and then he found out that there were some t tapes in England also, some some master tapes, and he got those from 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 the the original uh, Bradley Brothers. And they were stored very poorly, so he he took them to, to over to the United States, and I helped him to remaster and 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 to basically clean up and organize all those tapes. And and uh, he he had by then started to make spare tapes from Alatrons because you you couldn't get spare tapes if there was one tape was broken or or mangled. You, it was it was if it's often in the middle of the keyboard, it was not so such a useful instrument anymore. So. Everybody was really happy when he started to make those for enthusiasts, and then when when Oasis and Nelly Furtado and Radiohead and all those bands started using it again, it grew in popularity, and uh, we we started making new analog mellotrons in around about uh, 1999. We started delivering the first ones that were looked like the uh, the the white. Um, M400, but we called it the Mark VI because it had some significant improvements and a tube output stage, and the 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 tape, the replay mechanism was improved, so so it would play as easily as the very old instrument that also had a slightly better tape uh, transport mechanism, so to say. So, but it's the same principle. You can change out the tapes, like on the 400. I should have mentioned that. That's an important feature of the 400. You can actually take off the keyboard easily and and put in a new set of tapes. So for instance, Tangerine Dream, they had like 24 or something tape frames with sound effects and and uh, and, and it's custom made sounds and, and just a truckload of, of different vibraphones and oboe and whatnot. So so you, you could actually have a, a big library of, of, of sample packs, so to say, but they were kind of big <laughs> because each tape frame is like a this size and, and it's, it's, you have to have like a rack to put them in. Yes? Um, it seems to me that emulation of orchestral sounds is the main stock and trade here. Yeah. Like uh, with the Beatles, why would they choose to use that intro for Strawberry Fields instead of employing flutists? Well, I think it it was they were searching for to to do something new and and you can play chords in a in a different way, of course, than when you have you'd have to have a flute section, so to say. And I think they were just looking for something uh, new and 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 uh, and it, and then <coughs> just just to open up new ways in music. And they were doing this in so many other ways too. And an interesting thing is that there's a bootleg of the intro to Strawberry Fields with the brass, actually. So I made over a hundred of, the, the, of these white uh, analog Mark VI Mellotrons, and even some double Mark VII Mellotrons uh, for, for uh, Smashing Pumpkins and Wilco, for instance. And in, in uh, about ten years ago, I started to see that the, there was, um, the technology had become ripe to do something um, that uh, in the digital realm, so, so to say, also. And one of the things we we could we were we were able to, uh, we wanted to do right from the from the start is if you this on the Chamberlain you can and, and also to some extent on the Mellotron if depending on how you press down the keys you will get more or less volume and so basically you get poly aftertouch and that was some of the especially Chamberlain users John Bryan for instance. You really use that really create in a creative way, and so that's what we what we wanted to 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 do on on the model that we were. So you 
can emphasize different parts of the keyboard as you play, and that makes actually a lot of sense since you're playing, uh, you're not playing, in most cases, you're not playing a, 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 a piano sound or a other percussive sound, you're playing, playing a sample that you might want to influence as, she, as the sound plays, so to say. And, and so, so that's, we, that's why we, we were, in, we right from the start intended to, to bring out such a keyboard, because also it was very, it's very uncommon for keyboards nowadays to have this poly after touch. So, so and, and we, we, we figured out a way of how to do that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a reliable manner, not using optics or anything, it's a magnetic sensor. And uh, then we we also were were keen on having the optimum playback quality, and also then not to MP3 or reduce the sounds in any way, uh, like many sample playback instrument makers do to reduce the amount of data. So we so we decided on on direct streaming from compact flash cards. So we. Uh, we, we we we're the only ones that are using a direct streaming technology, so we can we we we, we have full uh, um, wave file playback basically. So it's 24-bit sounds that are played back. So there's no uh, there's no so to say no compromise on that end. And uh, the, so we came out with the with the M4000D, which is this one, which has the wooden keys and the and the poly aftertouch and everything, and it's got hundred sounds built into it that you can select easily. And then there's Expansion packs uh, like like this with the with the um, uh, with the uh, the on compact flashcards. It's a custom format, so. They went in and, and actually did longer loops, which is of course really tricky because they had to sync up with the with the with the rhythms. So so they but they did a bunch of of of, of sounds that actually have this, for example. And there you go. They did these. Um, they did it pretty well, actually. They did some pretty good, good um, uh, uh, fills, as they call it. So this is the left-hand side from the from the from the Mark II, and this is uh, if I can find the. Yes. This was used by the the Kinks on. Uh, Village Green Preservation Society. There's a song called Phenomenal Cap. That that's one note that's in there. And then he starts playing the flute on the lead side, so to say. So it's uh, it it's, it was rarely used, uh, but still some used it. And you might uh, recognize this uh, sound, huh? <laughs> the 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 it's uh, it's actually <coughs> hidden in the accordion. Bass note is so that's what's used by the Beatles on Bungalow Bill. That's the intro, and the, the, the actually they used on that song, um, and that's the only use we know of, of of the mandolin and the trombone. So on on Bungalow Bill, the the, the melody is played by the by the with the trombone, and the background is is the mandolin. So then we have for for the. Uh, the, the the next sound card is basically the same principle, but it's all Chamberlain sounds. So you have the Chamberlain version version of everything. Yeah. And if we can find yes, maybe his fields are often shorter or. Which is fairly easy to record. So you can hear the increased fidelity in, on those. Yeah, yeah. He 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 had he had like a, a U47 and an Ampex 
full track, just straight in. And they were recording in a, in a studio, the Meltram company, <laughs> that is, were recording in a studio that m was maybe, there was definitely some losses <laughs> on the way. And, and w also in the process when they were making the master tapes, there were m many more losses, um, evidently, uh, than in, in, on the Chamberlain. The f fidelity of the Chamberlain sounds is fantastic. <laughs> the problem with, with his <laughs> instruments is that, that first of all, the playback mechanism is a little bit dodgy, but also he put in, especially in the M instruments, the first run of M instruments was the preamp was just horrible. <laughs> it just some Radio Shack thing that you hardly could tell the difference between an oboe and a clarinet. So he really bizarre decisions that he made but then there, the he in in the later m1s there was he got some consultant in and they put in a, an ic preamp that that really gives you also a little bit of mid emphasis so that gives you this this uh, uh, very shiny chamberlain uh, uh, sound so to say which i actually am able to demonstrate because we ha have um uh, we have a uh, we, you can set the character in these instruments between, like now it is, it's a 400 character, and we can set it to be sounding like a Mark II. So it's a much bassier and murkier. For the Chamberlain, we have this would be Chamberlain, uh, a Chamberlain sound through a 400, relatively neutral, <laughs> relatively. The Malfan character, but with the Chamberlain character, it's a totally different thing. And that, of course, is with the IC preamp, not with the old Radio Shack one. That would just sound like somebody had put the sock on the mic or something like that, just, uh, it, it, to me, it's completely inexplicable why he would do that, because the heads were excellent also, the, the playback heads on the M series were fantastic, so, so, um, uh, but, and, and, and even on, uh, even on these, he made also the M2 Chamberlain, which is 25 keys plus 35 keys, and the, the 25 keys, if you remember, that's from the, the 600 Music Master instrument. Which uh, which had the 17 rhythms, but then the 25 lead keys and then the 35 lead keys, so to say. And the le of, of course the left hand keyboard just looked like one big keyboard, so to say. But but it it was actually split in the middle. And so so he took that library, some of those sounds, and put into the M2 Chamberlain. And he had some different master tapes to choose from, so you could choose different combinations of sounds in for both the M1 but also for the M2 left hand side. And then he made, for <laughs> even more inexplicable reasons, the M4 Chamberlain, which is two M2s stacked on top of each other, and that was sold. Moody Blues had one of those for Seventh Sojourn, the last record uh, in the 70s. And uh, the, uh, um, Three Dog Night actually toured with, with one of those on a, on a like a welded steel <laughs> frame which you have to have because this thing is not very stable and it's very heavy inside of course so it will just warp um, uh, so he made just a couple of those maybe four or something like that and then he made his Rolls Royce model which was the Chamberlain Riviera which had a real um, um, organ style uh, control panel and, and keyboard setup and everything and uh, his his own uh, uh, custom model had uh, even speakers built into it and and uh, and the volume pedal and that just shows how, how he was designing things there were three <coughs> power amps on top of each other and the way he did the volume pedal was that he had a string between the the volume knobs and the volume knobs were little pieces of, of wood so to say no. yep so we pressed the, the pedal it would pu pull a string and the string would go he wasn't into electronics let's put it that way so um and also that model actually several he made maybe four of those and and the the, 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 the th three of them two definitely had bass pedals also because he was also making a remote unit which had instead of keys on the on the keys so to say it had solenoids pulling each key down so it was just a box that you 
could remotely control via control signals that were basically just triggering each of these solenoids and would pull down each, each note as you went. And he sold those as extensions to Hammond organs. So there was a guy in, in Lake Tahoe called Ron Rose who had Ron Rose's magic organ and he was like a virtuoso on the, on the, on the Hammond and then he would just flip a switch and there were like strings and flutes going and this was like in the 60s so everybody was just like what is this? The, he, he, and, and the box was just hidden off stage and was just a cable going to the box. So, and he did, did that also with the M series. So, so, so you could buy an ex extender for for your M and and have uh, four sounds at the same time, or or in, or a library, a sort of, a, so to say, a bigger library, and then you can have like a mixer and can mix between those four sounds. It was very uncommon that people used it that way, but it did, it did exist. And then, in this Riviera model, he had actually a 25 note remote inside also, if as if the four manuals wasn't enough, to control with with uh, bass pedals. So you can have your accompaniments on on the bass pedals, and it would trip. The bass pedals were just electronic, and would just trigger each and every of these uh, remote loops, so to say. Uh, but of course, again, loops in the sense of non-endless loops. So they were also uh, eight seconds long, basically, and. <clears throat> Which is the big drawback, of course, because in a way it makes, if you can master it, which is really tricky, to, to, to play one of these, you get a more lively situation than if you just have a key and it would just run and run and run and run. He made those boxes also called the Rhythmates. You might have seen those in certain studios. It's, it's 17 <coughs> uh, loops with three tracks each. And you can you, you 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 it just that it it that's an endless loop. That's the endless loop uh, version of, of 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 the Chamberlain, so to say. And and so you set the the head to a certain loop, and then select A, B, or C, and then you have a Roomba or whatever going, so to say, endlessly. Yes. Was uh, Optagon related, or Optagon? I'm not sure how to pronounce. To Optagon, or, or, yeah, orchestra. Yeah, yeah, related in a way. It's sample playback. So to to round off the whole thing of the of the tape keyboards, there was also something called the Birotron, and that was Rick Wakeman financed that, and that was uh, eight track cartridges um, <laughs> stacked in in a unit, and uh, they didn't think of one important thing that eight track cartridges. You always have them. You're supposed to have them like this, not standing up. So that, it, that also never worked well. But they made about 10, and there's a few floating around, but they never work properly. But um, that was, th those were made to be endless. And the other mistake they made, so to say, is that they are running the whole time. So they would get used up fairly quickly, instead, compared to the Mellotron, which is only, the tape is only running when you're playing, or the chamber, of course. So, so there were four tracks on, on, on e uh, in each unit, so to say. And uh, and you you sell, you you move uh, the, the he uh, back of heads in the same way as on the Mellotron, but the attack and decay and everything is all electronic. So of course you can't have vibraphone because it, how would it know where to start? And it's endless. That's why the the loop is is completely unsuitable for for a tape replay instrument actually it's it's uh, uh, most people think I that in these instruments there are endless loops but it's 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 not and it would be it would make it sound like the biotron like a synth or something because you lose all the character in the attack and everything even on, on, on in in the in the strings here you can hear there's things happening you hear the start and then there's all this dynamic happening. If it would just be a, a loop, it would just sound sterile. So the um, uh, so the, the Birotron is just a side note, but that's the third only tape replay instrument that exists. Then the Mattel came up with the op Optigon, and 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 the s more the same idea as the original Mellotron idea was, or the Chamberlain Music Master idea, to have a home entertainment organ. And of course, the, op the, on the Optigon, the 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 the, the loops. The rhythm loops are of course endless because it's a it's a, an optical disc with with the with analog optical recordings of the sounds, and when and and the other benefit is of course they're synced they're synced up because the, 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 they're they're of course they're fixed on the on the plate so to say on the on the disc so you you, you if you, if you change to a different key which is a different track they will be synced up with the rest if you did the disc the correct way of course. 
and then there on the disc there's also a bunch of tracks for the for the keyboard also so to say so and uh, uh, and then uh, 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 the, the company called Vac Vaco Industries to, took the idea and made a pro version of it, which is the orchestra, and uh, that was used on stage by Kraftwerk. And many people think that, therefore, that what they used in the studio was uh, orchestra, but uh, I believe it's only on uh, uh, the model uh, that they used the, the, the orchestra and choir. All the other stuff is, is Mellotron. So to say that they used on radioactivity and Trans, Trans Europe Express, etc. So, so th that uh, uh, then there is also the the Chilton talent maker that took the Optigon idea right off. Ex ex exactly the same thing. They were trying to improve on it and made their own recordings, but they didn't license with Mattel, so they were just sued to smithereens right away. And there's only like two or three of those, but they're very good recordings, and we will hopefully sooner than later, have a card out with with most of all of these sounds from those optical instruments, so to say. And that's the last branch of the, so to say, analog sample playback tree, so to say, uh, from the 70s. Yeah. So would those, would those have the same problem with uh, having the attack on, since those are endless? Exactly, essentially. exactly. But yeah. they're really good for rhythms. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. exactly. Exactly. Exactly, precisely. So you, you have there's no vibraphone on on as an orchestra or or, or optigon sound, and there's no piano because it, it could know where it would just it just an electronic start of the whole th of of the of the track, so to say. So it would just be it just rotates, and then you go in, and it, it wherever it's at, wherever it's at, it will start there, so to say. So so it's strings and flutes, mostly organs that they have for the for the right hand side, so to say. And it, it was more for a home home toy, so to say, but and made like toys also. Uh -huh. They suck to fix. <laughs> it's horrible. Even the orchestra is not carried out that well, but it was it's more professional and it's better made. Uh, but there were there was only. Eight or ten discs, I think, <coughs> like flute, choir. The pipe, pipe organ is really good. That's was it's that was many people used it just for that because it had a really good pipe organ sound and some other, you know, saxophone and clarinet stuff like that. So, so they they, 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 they they it that was sort of a good idea, but the the technology the fidelity is just too. It's not good enough, and and they they were not that tech savvy when they did it. So there there's the the motor control is uh, and uh, you know it's just uh, a lot of trouble with it basically. And so to round off on the digital side, we then came out with a more portable version of of the M4000D, which is the M4000D Mini, and then we came out with the M4000D Rack, which is this one precisely that with it balanced out and everything, but just of course no keyboard or nothing. So. Uh, and then uh, about a year ago, we came out with a micro, which is uh, which is not an M4000D instrument. It's based on uh, not on compact flash, but on on, on uh, SD cards. So it's a completely different audio engine, but it's more compact and it uh, it's not expandable, but it gives you the hundred sounds of these instruments, but you can't expand it. Uh, because the, the the bus of the of the compact flash card is works in these different from the SD card in these, and then of course we we had a uh, it's only two octave keyboard because keyboards like this you can't order uh, they're custom made because F three to F three octaves it just doesn't exist as as a pre made keyboard so we make we use a twenty five key C to C keyboard here and then we have a. octave switch to get the whole range of, of the Mellotron, so to say. So, uh, so that's, uh, it, it, it was something we, we, we thought uh, that there were a lot of young upcoming musicians and that were, this was just uh, too big a budget. So that's why we, and, and the main reason, and this of course also because it's got the wooden keys and everything, that's the, the keyboard is the big culprit, so to say. So that's why we decided to, to put in, it's a very high quality keyboard with, with weighted keys and everything, a semi-weighted I should say. So it's, it's, it's of good quality, but we can just, we don't have to mess around with it like we have to do with that one. We can just take it right out of the box and put it in. Like all other synth manufacturers, they also, also only use Fatar's line of, of, of keys. You can't make Fatar do a custom thing. You have to sort of 
stick to what 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 they what they make, and that applies to Moog and Nord and uh, Dave Smith Instruments and all those medium-sized manufacturers that are out there. They're not like Yamaha and Roland. They have their own little thing going. So, so. so yeah. So any more, any questions? Yes. Um, original uh, Mellotrons and Chamberlains were mono, correct? Yes, all mono. Yeah. And, and yours is stereo. Yeah, it's well, it's stereo it's about? it's 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 not uh, the samples are not stereo. It's just that you can get uh, from A direct A and B. You can get the, the, there are two tracks. Of course, you have A and B, and you can mix them. Of course, like like you you could on the on the original instrument. So the direct outputs are just direct out. From, from A and B, and then the master, which we're using here, you can control from the front panel with volume and tone and, and, and the mix, of course. And we added some features, for instance, the half speed, and also we have a quarter speed setting, so it goes down a, 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 yet another octave. This is something I introduced on the, on the, on the Mark VI Mellotron, that, that the motor can go down to half speed. We have we have a retrofit co motor control for the 400 because, as I was mentioning, those are, are really horrible those motor controls. So we made ma we made a remake of what they did back in the 70s, and I added the two-speed feature for for that. So you can have a 400 with like a half-speed switch, and that got very popular. So we put that in the Mark VI, and then we put it into this instrument also. But none of the original metal trains had this. So and then of course it has the. Uh, the pitch knob, as as the Mellotrons do, and 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 so the so the direct output is not influenced by the tone and volume. It just uh, it just straight out from from A A or B, so to say. Yes, yes. Um, my brother and I have the micro, which we love, but we've, we've had some MIDI issues, like some MIDI oh, log yeah. amps going into it. Is that a known problem or anything? Yeah, yeah, we, we have updated the MIDI firmware for that. So you just contact us and we will set you up with a, with a new firmware, so to say. And, and the slot in the back here, this, uh, this uh, SD card slot, is, as it says here, it's not for expansion, it's only for update. Oh, so okay. So I'll send you a card and it just updates. Oh, perfect, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Any other? Yes? Yeah, I mean, uh, like Jimmy Smith in the jazz world used to put a padlock down on a key if he wanted to keep it in a constant sustain. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. So, like, I'm sort of, I was fascinated when you talked about aftertouch, mm -hmm. which I don't completely understand. But can you manipulate the after aftertouch as well? I mean, uh, in other words, the decay of something. No, no, no. It, it's just it's very straight, f simple. It, it's the tape gets pressed against the head by a little hammer in the in the in the 400 and or any Mellotron or any chamber, yeah. and 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 that little felt pad <coughs> presses the tape against the head, and you can you can when you when you you can put you can play in in a position slightly in between, so there's the the tape doesn't quite touch the head, but just goes almost on it and then there will be still a little bit of, of magnetic energy coming into the head and pick that it will pick it up so you can literally do this kind of uh, uh, volume fade in of course what we've done here is far more reproducible and far more cons consistent all across the keyboard and, 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 and everything and also between the instruments you have to have a, a chamberlain that's really well set up and or Mellotron for this to work so to say and because it wasn't intended to be used like this you were supposed to be hammering down on the keys basically did that sort of clarify things because it's only it's only while you're playing the tape you sort of can press the tape harder or softer against the head, and and because it's of course one key for each and one tape for each key, it's polyphonic. The aftertouch. Well, I'm interested in what you can now do on your present instrument. Oh, th it's, it does only volume. It's only only the volume thing, and that was difficult enough, I can say. <laughs> so let's do a mix here. It's only the, the volume that you can influence, but it it has a uh, it has poly aftertouch out via MIDI, so you can use a, uh, use it to control any parameter on any other soft synth or something like that. Well, what if you want to keep one key down while you move your hand? 
Uh, you, 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 th there's, uh, there is a, you can use sustain, there's a sustain input, but that will of course sustain the whole keyboard, so to say. Mm. So you'd have to put a padlock on it, I guess. Mm. <laughs> so. and, and, and John Modeski, for instance, he, uh, in Modeski, Martin and Wood, he ha used a 400 and he, he grabbed the flywheel and, and, and you stop it and you, you can do some creative stuff with it. There, also John Bryan and, and, and Patrick Warren, they had on some of their Chamberlains, they had the flywheel on the Mellotron is on this side and on the Chamberlain is on this side. So they had a hole cut out on the, in, the, in the top and so they can do like, especially on the Chamberlain with the, how the motor works and how the pitch knob doesn't work at all well on the Chamberlain. So you could like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, do like, you know, slide the guitar play with, mm. with this, with, by touching the flywheel on, on, the, on, the, mm. on the Chamberlain. The, the Mellotron, it, it, it doesn't work as well to do that kind of thing on a Mellotron, but, but they did that quite a lot actually. I've seen quite a few of those with the cut out above the flywheel, so to say. Any other? We can have some questions. Yes? Can you change the color of the amp? Yes, we can do that. <laughs> so yeah. we, can, we can, there's a little in interesting deta detail we, we added to this. So you, it's by touch you can you can make it cycle around in the in different colors. So it's like, yeah, yeah. So, it's, yeah, so so it's we 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 try our best to do something that's a little bit different from everybody else and and uh, just uh, to put in some really high quality stuff in it and uh, and uh, and uh, especially with with the keyboards we find it important and also with the, with the screens and everything so we we try to do take a little extra, extra step compared to just trying to push the cost down into and making everything in China so all of this is made in Sweden it's some parts of course are from the Far East or from Italy and the, like the keyboards but uh, we everything is assembled in Stockholm and 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 uh, all of the electronics and everything is is populated and made in, in, in Sweden, so to say. So it's, but we're actually now turning also to the US for supplying of these enclosures for the, for the instruments. So it's, uh, we, 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 but, but we found that, that to get this kind of quality, you, you can't turn to the, to the Far Eastern suppliers when it comes to this kind of precision details and you're, we're not making these in millions like certain other companies, so to say. That can have like a whole factory just dedicated to a product. So, yes, we were talking about uh, just pressing a key down with something and leaving it. Um, once the ta eight second tape loop ends, don't you have to repress the key? Yeah, or does yeah. it rewind and then just keep? No, no, it, it you, you have to repress it. It's just it it runs out after. That's the okay. end of the recording. So. So it's it's uh, we, we the the sounds on the Optagon card will loop, but it will not loop the sounds on the uh, in the Mellotron. So mm -hmm. here here's for example, um, yes, custom, custom recordings by Yes and Jack Bruce. Uh, Steve Hackett's weird voice, uh, voice, uh, it's some sort of drone that he uh, So there's a bunch of, of, of yeah, Black Sabbath is, uh, uh, th this is, uh, this is, there are custom recordings by John Keating, uh, uh, an English um, avant-garde, shall one say, uh, composer. So it's a bunch of uh, percussion things. Like Sabbath's custom version. So, so we we want to still for it to be a library that people send us sounds, and then we can put them on 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 cards or on on the expansion cards, and and we want to keep it this way. So so the, so the library keeps on expanding, and uh, the, it, we just decided on that, and that's the way to go. There's so many other sample instruments that you can sample yourself, and that's sort of a different idea, so to say. Yeah, but um, I'm here, I'm around afterwards for any questions, so thank you.